Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa 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 Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddham Saranam Gachami Buddham Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami Sangam Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami Dutiyampi Sangham Saranam Gachami Tutiampi Sangam Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Buddhang Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Buddham Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami Tatiampi Dhammam Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Sanghang Saranam Gachami Tatiyampi Sanghang Saranam Gachami Ti Saranagamanang Niti Tang Ama Bhante Panati Pata Viratmani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Panati Pata Viratmani Sikha Padam Samadhyami Adimna Dana Vedamani Sikha Padam Samadhyami Adina Dana Vedamani Sikha Padam Samadhyami Kami Sumitcha Chara Vedamani Sikha Padam Samadhyami Kami Sumitcha Chara Vedamani Sikha Padam Samadhyami Musavada Vedamani Sikha Padam Samadhyami Musavada Vedamani Sikha Padam Samadhyami Sura Meraya Manja Pamada Tana Vedamani Sikha Padam Samadhyami Sura Meraya Manja Pamadatana Veramani Sikha Padam Samadhyami Imani Pancha Sikha Padani Sile na Sugating Yanti Sile na Boga Sampada Sile na Niputing Yanti Tasma Silang Wisodha Ye Sadhu 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 We're on the Sabhavasa Sutta. Uh, thus have I heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's part. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, bhikkhus, I shall teach you a discourse on the restraint of all the taints. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied. The blessed one said this. <clears throat> bhikkhus, I say that the, that the destruction of the taints is for one who knows and sees, not for one who does not know and see. Who knows and sees what? Wise attention and unwise attention. When one attends unwisely, unarisen taints arise and arisen taints increase. 
when one attends wisely, unarisen taints do not arise and arisen taints are abandoned. Because there are taints that should be abandoned by seeing. There are taints that should be abandoned by restraining. There are taints that should be abandoned by using. There are taints that should be abandoned by enduring. There are taints that should be abandoned by avoiding. There are taints that should be abandoned by removing. There are taints that should be abandoned by developing. Taints to be abandoned by seeing. What taints because should be abandoned by seeing? Here because an unthought ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma, who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma, does not understand what things are fit for attention and, and what things are unfit for attention. Since that is so, he attends to those things unfit for attention and he does not attend to those things fit for attention. 6. What are the things unfit for attention that he attends to? They are things such that when he attends to them, the unarising taint of sensual desire arises in him, and the arising taint of sensual desire increases. The unarising taint of being arises in him, and the arising taint of being increases. The unarising taint of ignorance arises in him, and the arising taint of ignorance increases. These are the things unfit for attention that he attends to. And what are the things fit for attention that he does not attend to? They are things such that when he attends to them, the unarisen taint of sensual desire does not arise in him, and the arisen taint of sensual desire is abandoned. The unarisen taint of being does not arise in him, and the arisen taint of being is abandoned. The unarisen taint of ignorance does not arise in him and the arisen taint of ignorance is abandoned. These are the things fit for attention that he does not attend to. By attending to things unfit for attention, and by not attending to things fit for attention, but when arisen taints arise in him, and arisen taints increase. This is how he attends unwisely. Was in the past, was, in no, was I not in the past? What was I in the past? How was I in the past? Having been what, what did I become in the past? Shall I be in the future? Shall I not be in the future? What shall I be in the future? How shall I be in the future? Having been what? What shall I become in the future? Or else he is unwarily perplexed about the present dust. Am I? Am I not? What am I? How am I? Where has the being come from? Where will it go? When he attends unwisely in this way, one of six views arises in him. The view, self exists for me, arises in him as true and established. Or the view, no self exists for me, arises in him as true and established. Or the view, I perceive self with self, arises in him as true and established. Or the view, I perceive not self with self arises in him as true and established, or the view 
I perceive self with not self arises in him as true and established, or else he has some such view as this. It is this self of mine that speaks and feels and experiences here and there the result of good and bad actions. But this self of mine is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and it will endure as long as eternity. This speculative view, Vicus, is called the thicket of views, the wilderness of views, the contortion of views, the vacillation of views, the fetter of views. Fettered by the fetter of views, the untaught ordinary person is not freed from birth, aging, and death, from sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. He is not freed from suffering, I say. Because okay, a couple of things about that paragraph. Um, it's a bit of an awkward translation. Atime ata. Atime ata just means there is myself. It's self exists for me it might sound a little bit what what exactly does that mean for me i, I guess you can understand it but atimeyata is probably the simplest way you can say i have a self or yeah because in pali the thing about pali is they don't use the word have same with sanskrit they don't say i have this or i have that this is how they say it they say atimeya atime and then whatever it is the thing of me exists or my thing exists what it, what it means is, uh, I have a self. And the other thing, so this this for me is a little bit misleading maybe. The other thing is, um, and it's maybe just a nitpick, but the last, the second last sentence, this speculative view, does, the translation, or the Pali doesn't actually say that. It says, this is called... And it's it's a bit confusing because it isn't a view, it's six views, right? One of six views arises when he says, this speculative view, well, it's confusing what's going on here. That's not what it says. It just says, idang vuchati bikove titigatang, etc. This is called, this, this sixfold, this set of six views is called the thicket of views, the wilderness of views, etc., etc. So that's all I had to say. 9. Bhikkhus, a well-taught noble disciple, who has regard for noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their dharma, who has regard for true men and is skilled and disciplined in their dharma, understands what things are fit for attention and what things are unfit for attention. Since that is so, he does not attend to those things unfit for attention, and he attends to those things fit for attention. 10. What are the things unfit for attention that he does not attend to? They are things such that when he attends to them, the unarisen taint of sensual desire arises in him, and the arising taint of ignorance increases. These are the things unfit for attention that he does not attend to. And what are the things fit for attention that he attends to? They are things such that when he attends to them, the unarising taint of sensual desire does not arise in him, and the unarising taint of ignorance is abandoned. These are the things fit for attention that he attends to. By not attending to things unfit for attention, and by attending to things fit for attention, Unarisen tents do not arise in him, and arisen tents are abandoned. He attends wisely. So attend, attends is a bit, I'm going to nitpick on his translation probably the whole way through. But attends here is, it really doesn't capture what's going on here. Let me just go, let's just go back a second. Can you just hold on a second? I would rather say something like keeps in mind. I guess it's also nitpicking. It's just... It's not so much about attending. It's about, um, yeah, keeping in mind. And the idea is is uh, not even so much the object of your attention, 
right? The, the problem I have with it is that in mindfulness, you really should attend to everything, but it's more the qualities of mind. So rather than saying exactly the things that you keep in mind, the, the, uh, the qualities of mind that you, you, you stick to, so when you're observing anything, what are the qualities of mind you use? What is the state of mind that you have? So this is called yoni so manasikara. Manasi means in the mind. Yon, uh, karoti means uh, to, to he, he or she makes or does. And yoni so means to the root or to the origin, to the yoni, to the womb. So how you keep something in mind. And I, I think it misses something in translation or it loses something. Because it's not exactly only attend to certain things and don't attend to other things. But really, manas, manasikara or manasikarana is, uh, is the really more about the, the way you approach something whether it's with wisdom or not with wisdom, whether it's mindfulness or without mindfulness. So I guess I guess at the very least it should rather be than attention, it should be keep in mind. But I think that it's hard to actually get the meaning across. Or maybe I'm being unfair. But I, rather than attends, at least I would put uh, keeps in mind. Bante, the translation kind of tries to address the special way of keeping in mind by saying not just attend, but attend wisely. How does that miss uh, the yoni somanasikara, the way you uh, mind it? Well, I, I guess uh, immediately the, the word attend isn't... Yeah, you might be right. It's not so bad. He attends wisely. This is suffering. He attends wisely. This is the origin of suffering. He attends wisely. This is the cessation of suffering. He attends wisely. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. When he attends wisely in this way, three fetters are abandoned in him. Personality view, doubt, and adherence to rules and observances. These are called the taints that should be abandoned by seeing. Taints to be abandoned by restraining. What taints bhikkhus should be abandoned by restraining? Here a bhikkhu, reflecting wisely, abides with the eye faculty restrained. While taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who abides with the eye faculty unrestrained, there are no taints, vexation, or fever in one who abides with the eye faculty restrained. Reflecting wisely, he abides with the ear faculty restrained, with the nose faculty restrained, with the tongue faculty restrained, with the body faculty restrained, with the mind faculty restrained. While taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who abides with the faculties unrestrained, there are no taints, vexation, or fever in one who abides with the faculties restrained. These are called the taints that should be abandoned by restraining. If you look at uh, look at note thirty six, he he Bikabodi understands this. It's not his problem. It's just I'm not comfortable really with the word attending, but maybe it's not that big of a deal. Anyway, read note thirty six to get what I'm trying to get across. He he talks about what the commentary says. 36 is in the end of, uh, at the end of part of 5, right? Yes. Adherence to rules and observance is, uh, is just a short form for... And, and it's, rather than using words like that, if you look at the Pali or if you get it, if you understand, it's talking about two categories of things. One category of things is things that one um, abstains from, and one category of things is one which one uh, partakes in or practices. And so the idea here is that religious people have, generally speaking, two types of practices. They make a vow or a, a determination to not do certain things, 
and they keep in their mind the idea that not doing those certain things is necessary for enlightenment, whatever their idea of, or for the ultimate goal of their religious practice. And the other, um, the, the things that they, they make a vow or determination and they hold up as necessary, the practice of certain things. So certain practices. Now, there are certain practices and certain abstentions that are not necessary. And some people take those things as necessary. So adherence to sila and vata are specifically sila and vata. Paramasa means uh, outside of the path that are held held outside of the path. I think keeps in mind rather than attends. The idea is how you make up your mind, like what you make your mind up of. What what things do you? What are the flowers that you grow in your mind? I think. So the idea is that when when you experience something, it's not the thing that you experience that you keep in mind or don't keep in mind. It's the anger or the greed towards it that you keep in your mind. Dante, uh, in the last section, the taint to be abandoned by restraining, uh, there's mention of reflecting wisely. Does that do justice to the Pali or do you have issue as you had with attending wisely? No, that one's very close. But the Sankhaya Yoniso. Yoniso, again, it's the word Yoniso and it's translated, it's not literal. Yoniso doesn't mean wisely, not literally. It means to the root, to the core, to the to the origin, to the essence. But the Sankhaya Yoniso, it's a very standard um, phrase. But the Sankhaya means reflecting. But, but it's, literally, Yoniso is a much nicer word than just wisely. Because it's very, it has a specific meaning that's very, very insightful. When you think of yoni so, you, it's really actually not just wisely, which could mean many things to different people. It, it, it's very specific in its meaning that to the root, to the origin. So when you um, restrain the eye faculty, it's by going to the root of the matter, sticking to the eye faculty, so that the eye faculty is just the eye faculty. And restrained isn't. It doesn't have to be translated as restrained. It could be guarded. I think. Not sure which one's more literal, but guarded sometimes has a better connotation, because mindfulness guards maybe a bit better than it restrains. And there's the a, a simile, I think, of the gatekeeper. Yes. And the gatekeeper doesn't restrain anything. He guards or she guards. Thank you, Bank. We read it a little dis different aspect of this, that uh, in Pali is the, 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 are the views have different aspects like this? no this is much more a uh, oratory device when giving when when speaking when teaching I mean I find myself doing it all the time you you say something once and then you say it with a simile with a synonym. Because it helps to get the point across, to repeat, okay. to go over the same thing again. Why is this matter if it's wilderness contortional? He's trying to provide them with a, a, an idea of what he's talking about, a, a real impression. And so that's the looking at it from different perspectives, different words. Yeah. But you'll see that throughout the Pali, you'll see where he says it one way and then he uses a different word. And it's quite remarkable. The, I mean, well, it's, you know, it's, it's nice to read the, the way he's able to you know, go for, uh, find lists like that. Quite masterful use of language. But the taints and the fetters are just two different lists. Asava is a difficult word. So I guess I should talk about it because it's this sutta, right? Asava has something to do with flowing. It's a word that relates to liquids. So you have to understand about the Buddha's teaching, there's many, many lists with an intense amount of overlap. And so trying to map out each and one of the lists and try to figure out um, 
you know, what's different about them. The difference is how they were used and when they were used and uh, why they were used. So the Buddha would use certain ones, perhaps with certain audiences in mind. Um, you know, sometimes a long list is, you'll see that certain lists have uh, different uh, inflections or different, uh, they stress different things, they have a different quality to them. So the asava are three or four things, and it's a short list. And it's category. It's actually three or four categories of defilements. Ultimately, these are all the bad things. The, whether you're talking about fetters or you're talking about asava, uh, so if you want to um, sort them all out, the Visuddhimagga does exactly that at the very end of the book when it talks about which fetters are destroyed, uh, and not just fetters, but which defilements are destroyed, in all the many lists of them, at each of the four paths. It it so it. Um, it helps sort out which is which. But asava is more simple and, and a category of things. There's, and there's, so it's it's not a, you couldn't find a one-to-one -one between the asava and the sanyojana, which are the fetters. Probably because the asava are, again, types. And, and one of the sanyojanas might fit in more than one of the asavas. So the asavas are kama asava, asavas relating to sensuality, bau asava, bau, uh, asavas relating to becoming, avijja asava, dita asava and avijja asava, I think, right? Uh, yeah. Dit, diti relating to views and avijja relating to ignorance. So it's kind of how they come about. They come about based on one of those four things. And asava is just really means defilement. The fetters are ten specific things that really are most often taught relating to each of the four paths where um, one of the paths removes one of the fetters or several of the fetters. Kilesa means defilement, so that's what I was using there. When I say the asavas are just categories of defilements, really. They're categories of kilesa. So, Bhante, in 43, he mentions like seven methods mentioned in the sutta affect their abandonment, uh, like in the back section, the notes to the sutta. 40, uh, oh, the note 43? Yeah. Yeah, note 43, they are talking about the seven methods mentioned in the sutta affect their abandonment, seeing and development, which between them compromise the four super mundane paths. The other five methods cannot directly accomplish the destruction of the text. Can you please talk a little bit about what methods he is mentioning in this footnote? Well, that's what this sutta is. Each of these is, a, is one of the seven methods. Oh, okay, thank you. So this sutta outlines seven methods. Uh, they're not called methods here, right? They're called taints to be abandoned by X. So the X is the, me the method. The first was by seeing, the last is by developing. Okay, thank you. Taints to be abandoned by using. What taints bhikkhus should be abandoned by using? Here a bhikkhu, reflecting wisely, uses the rope only for protection from cold, or protection from heat, or protection from contact with gadflies, mosquitoes, wind, the sun, and creeping things and only for the purpose of concealing the private parts. Reflecting wisely, he uses alms food, neither for amusement, nor for intoxication, nor for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness, but only for the endurance and continuance of this body, for ending discomfort, and for assisting the holy life, considering, thus I shall terminate old feelings without arousing new feelings and I shall be healthy and blameless, and shall live in comfort. Reflecting wisely, he uses the resting place only for protection from cold, for protection from heat, for protection from contact with gadflies, mosquitoes, wind, the sun, and creepy things, and only for the purpose of warding off the perils of climate and for enjoying retreat. 
Reflecting wisely, he uses the medicinal requisites only for protection from arisen afflicting feelings and for the benefit of good health. While taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who does not use the requisites thus, there are no taints, vexation, or fever in one who uses them thus. These are called the taints that should be abandoned by here a bhikkhu reflecting wisely bears cold and heat, hunger and thirst, and contact with catflies, mosquitoes, wind and the sun, and creeping things. He endures ill-spoken, unwelcome words, and arisen body feelings that are painful, racking, sharp, piercing, disagreeable, distressing, and menacing to life. While taints, vexations, vexation and fever might arise in one who does not endure such things, there are no taints, vexation, or fever in one who endures them. These are called taints that should be abandoned by enduring. Taints to be abandoned by avoiding. What taint, what taints bhikkhu should be abandoned by avoiding? Here a bhikkhu reflecting wisely avoids a wild elephant, a wild horse, a wild bull, a wild dog, a snake, a stump, a bramble patch. A chasm, a cliff, a cesspit, a sewer. Reflecting wisely, he avoids sitting on unsuitable seats, wandering to unsuitable resorts, and associating with bad friends. Since if you were to do so, wise companions in the holy life might suspect him of evil conduct. While taints, vexations, and fever might arise in one who does not avoid these things, there are no taints, vexations, vexation and fever in one who avoids them. These are called the taints that should be abandoned by avoiding. Taints to be abandoned by removing. 20. What taints bhikkhu should be abandoned by removing? Here a bhikkhu, reflecting wisely, does not tolerate an arisen thought of sensual desire. He abandons it, removes it, does away with it, and annihilates it. He does not tolerate an arisen thought of ill will. He does not tolerate an arisen thought of cruelty. He does not tolerate arisen evil unwholesome states. He abandons them, removes them, does away with them, and annihilates them. While taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who does not remove these thoughts, there are no taints, vexation, or fever in one who removes them. These are called the taints that should be abandoned by removing. Tends to be abandoned by developing. What tends bhikkhu should be abandoned by developing? Here a bhikkhu, reflecting wisely, develops the mindfulness, enlightenment factor, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. He develops the investigation of states enlightenment factor, the en energy enlightenment factor, the rapture enlightenment factor, the tranquility enlightenment factor, the concentration enlightenment factor, the equanimity enlightenment factor, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. While taints, vexation, and fever might arise in one who does not develop these enlightenment factors, there are no taints, vexation, or fever in one who develops them. These are called the taints that should be abandoned by developing. Conclusion, because when for a bhikkhu the taint that should be abandoned by seeing have been abandoned by seeing, when the taints that should be abandoned by restraining have been abandoned by restraining, when the taints that should be abandoned by using have been abandoned by using, when the taints that should be abandoned by enduring have been abandoned by enduring, when the taints that should be abandoned by avoiding have been abandoned by avoiding, when the taints that should be abandoned by removing have been abandoned by removing, when the taints that should be abandoned by developing have been abandoned by developing, then he is called a bhikkhu who dwells restrained with the restraint of all the taints. He has severe, severed craving flung off the fetters and with the complete penetration of conceit, he has made an end of suffering. This is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words.
uh, this might be a weird question, but um, I always thought that in the suttas, the term noble disciple was used for uh, people that were on the noble path. <clears throat> One of the, whether it's a stream entry, uh, Sakadagami, Anagami or Arahant, um, but here it is used uh, before uh, stream entry. Um, so, is um, is it used random or? Sorry, is what used? Well, the the term noble disciple, a well taught noble disciple. I thought it usually uh, points to um, people on the noble path or the one of the four noble paths. Uh, but here it is used uh, before someone attains uh, stream entry. Where do you see that? I'm not questioning. I just, uh, well, I'm questioning. I want to know for sure that uh, it says it's before. Yeah, first. but um, it's, uh, the, the first taint, taints to be abandoned by seeing, and then number nine. He says there, because a well-taught noble disciple, yada, yada, yada. And then uh, in 11, he says, uh, when he attends wisely this freeway, the, the first three, Peppers are abandoned, basically. So I'm a bit puzzled about right. that. And, and all the other, uh, it's just yeah. only Piku. It can mean, uh, the, the term is Arya Savaka, so there then I guess it means a disciple of the noble ones, not noble disciple. It depends how you translate the word. Arya Savaka could mean one who is a disciple of the noble ones. It could mean one who is a noble disciple. But really, it, it more likely means literally the disciple of the noble ones, the Arya Savaka. I'm not sure, actually. I think it can be used in both ways. It can be a Savaka of the Buddha who is an Arya, or a Savaka of the Arya who is the Buddha. Thank you. That doesn't confuse you. But yeah, you'll see that about this word. It's, it's used, it seems, in both ways. I think the confusion comes in that normally one is called that after becoming a sotapanna, but in in this, it's saying that it leads to the abandoning of those abandoning of those things that makes one become a sotapanna, if that's the right wording. Well, you could technically say that at the moment when one attends wisely. Um, and abandons the taints, right? What he's saying in number 11. At that moment, he is an Arya Savaka. At that moment, he is attending wildly, wisely. At that moment, the three fetters are abandoned at the, in him. And at that moment, he is a Sotapati Maga Pugala. He is the first of the eight noble ones. So technically, this still does mean that the Arya Savaka is a Sotapanna, but it's the Sotapanna, Sotapati Magga Jitta, the path. That moment is the moment of the path, which is the first of the eight noble ones. But it's only one moment. So technically, uh, yeah, it does mean that. You could say that. Practically speaking, maybe a bit far-fetched you could also argue no you could you could make some extension as I think the Buddha does to to what we call Kalyana Putujana which is someone who is still a Putujana but they are Kalyana they're beautiful they're they're good and so they the people on the path the Pupanga Manga you could also call them Arya uh, well Arya Savaka anyway because they're on the path to Sotapanna. That, that's a stretch. Anyway, I wouldn't make too much of it. Bante, is Seka a word for an individual who is uh, practicing or in training? Could you uh, explain? Yeah, it literally means one who has Sika. Sika means training. Seka, Seko, Seka is one who has Sika. 
the sika becomes long, the e becomes a because it's long sika. And the e becomes a because of the suffix that you add, because of turning it into a, a possessor of the thing. It's called tadita. Uh, and the word is used, I mean, it could be used in a mundane sense, but by the Buddha it's generally used to mean uh, an Arya Pugala, from Sotapanna on up to uh, Anagami, up to, I think, maybe even Arahatamaga, I'm not sure, first six or seven noble ones. Of course, the Arahat, the one who has attained Arahatampala is called Aseka. They have. They don't have training. Thank you, Bhante. So that word, as it's generally used by the Buddha, excludes absolutely excludes putujana, non arya pugala, and arahat, who is beyond or has completed what has to be done. That's right. Yes, but the arahat has the has its own term, which is aseka. Thank you, Bant. Okay, we have a board meeting in five minutes, so I'm going to have to leave shortly. But any other questions? <laughs>